வணக்கம் வெல்கம் டு திஸ் செஷன் ஆஃப் த ஹேண்ட் சர்ஜரி குவிஸ் த ஃபன் வே டு லேர்ன் ஹேண்ட் சர்ஜரி question number 1 the following are true about perilunate dislocation except occur due to fall on outstretched hand separation of lunate from capitate the classic sign on x ray is the spilled teacup sign can cause compression of the median nerve and the correct answer is the classical sign on x ray is the spilled teacup sign which is not true about perilunate dislocation to understand this we need to understand the difference between lunate and perilunate dislocation normally the radius lunate and the capitate are in a straight line in a lunate dislocation there is a separation of the lunate from both the capitate and the radius whereas in a perilunate dislocation there is a separation of the lunate only from the capitate the relationship of the lunate with the radius is intact there are a few differences between lunate dislocation and perilunate dislocation a fall on outstretched hand can cause both a lunate dislocation or a perilunate dislocation the incidence of lunate dislocation is less common when compared to the incidence of perilunate dislocation complications like median nerve compression or avascular necrosis of the lunate are more common in perilunate dislocation and as far as the appearance on x ray is concerned there are two characteristic signs of lunate dislocation on the wrist x ray the first is the piece of pie sign and the second is the spilled teacup sign the normal shape of the lunate bone on ap view of the wrist is quadrangular if there is a lunate dislocation the lunate bone now appears triangular resembling a cut piece of pie on the lateral view of the wrist we see what is known as a spilled teacup sign where the lunate appears like a cup that is tilted over like a spilled cup as far as the perilunate dislocation is concerned there are two important findings on x ray the capitate is displaced dorsal to the lunate and the lunate retains its normal contact with the radius question number 2 the classification of brachial plexus injuries into supraclavicular and infraclavicular was first made by terzis narakas leffert millesi and the correct answer is leffert but all the names mentioned as the other options have all made different classifications let us try to understand the different classification systems by using this simple diagram leffert classified brachial plexus injuries into two types the first was the supraclavicular injury which consisted of the supraganglionic infraganglionic and retroclavicular segments of the brachial plexus getting injured and the infraclavicular plexus involvement later krakor also classified brachial plexus injuries into two types the supraclavicular and the infraclavicular but he divided the supraclavicular injuries into injuries to the roots trunks and divisions and the infraclavicular injuries into the injuries to the cords and the branches terzis et al classified brachial plexus injuries into three types injuries to the roots injuries to the supraclavicular postganglionic segment and the infraclavicular segment millesi classified brachial plexus injuries into four types injuries to the supraganglionic roots injuries to the infraganglionic roots injuries to the trunks and injuries to the cords narakas classified brachial plexus injuries into five types injuries to the supraganglionic root injuries to the infraganglionic spinal nerve injuries to the infraganglionic trunk injuries to the retroclavicular zone and injuries to the terminal branches finally mckinnon et al have classified brachial plexus injuries into six types the first being root aversion both pre and post ganglionic trunk injury injuries to the lateral cord posterior cord medial cord 
and finally the terminal segments of the cord and branches injury question number 3 the schobinger clinical grading system is used for grading arteriovenous malformations capillary hemangiomas venous malformations infantile hemangiomas and the correct answer is the schobinger clinical grading system is used for grading arteriovenous malformations according to this system the first grade refers to the situation where the arteriovenous malformation appears as a pink blue stain with a little bit of warmth when the av malformation starts undergoing expansion it is considered as grade 2 and it is manifest as the above findings that is warmth plus pulsations with the presence of a thrill or a bruy all this expansion can lead to the grade of destruction when there are skin changes and ulcers and bleeding can develop and finally the grade of decompensation is reached where cardiac failure can supervene question number 4 the involvement of the hand in apert syndrome has been classified into three types by upton wheaton apert simon k and the answer is the involvement of the hand in apert syndrome has been classified into three types by upton children with apert syndrome may have a type 1 hand which is otherwise known as a spade hand in this type of hand the thumb is small and readily deviated with a shallow first web the index middle and ring fingers display complete or complex syndactyly the little finger is attached by a simple complete or incomplete syndactyly the type 2 hand is known as the mitten hand or the spoon hand here the thumb is readily deviated and has incomplete or complete simple syndactyly with the index finger the index long and ring fingers are distally fused creating a curve in the palm with divergent metacarpals and the little finger is attached to the ring with a mostly complete but simple syndactyly the type 3 hand or the rosebud hand is so called because the hand resembles a rosebud the thumb index middle and ring fingers are distally fused either with cartilaginous or bony attachments the thumb can be very difficult to identify separately from the index finger the little finger is united to the ring by simple complete syndactyly question number 5 Durkheim's compression test is done for detecting compression of median nerve ulnar nerve radial nerve at the elbow superficial branch of the radial nerve and the correct answer is Durkheim's compression test is done for detecting compression of the median nerve the carpal compression test or the durkheim's test is done by applying pressure over the area of the flexor retinaculum on the palm this should be maintained for a minimum of 30 seconds a positive test is when paresthesia is noted in the distribution of the median nerve by the patient a negative test is when there is no pain or any other symptom even for 3 minutes or longer question number 6 The carpal metacarpal joint of the thumb resembles a biconvex saddle joint, hinge joint, biconvex ball and socket joint, biconcave saddle joint. And the answer is the carpal metacarpal joint of the thumb resembles a biconcave saddle joint. The carpal metacarpal joint of the thumb of the trapezium metacarpal joint comprises the articulation between the trapezium and the base of the thumb metacarpal this articulation between the trapezium and the first metacarpal base resembles a biconcave saddle joint this is so because when we consider the trapezial surface it is concave in an ulnar radial direction and convex in a dorso palmar direction and when we consider the base of the first metacarpal it is convex in an ulnar radial direction and concave in a dorsopalmar direction since this joint is a 
pi concave saddle joint it allows for biaxial movements that is flexion extension and adduction abduction and in addition to these movements capsular laxity allows for rotation of the metacarpal on the trapezium question number 7 the most common thumb deformity in rheumatoid arthritis is swan neck deformity boutonniere deformity gamekeeper's thumb arthritis mutilans And the correct answer is the most common thumb deformity in rheumatoid arthritis is the boutonniere deformity. Nalibu has classified rheumatoid thumb deformities into six categories. The first category is the boutonniere deformity or the boutonniere thumb. Here the carpal metacarpal joint of the thumb is not involved but the metacarpophalangeal joint is flexed and the interphalangeal joint is hyperextended. In the type 2 deformity of the thumb, in addition to the boutonniere deformity described in type 1, there is a flexion or adduction at the carpometacarpal joint of the thumb also. The type 3 thumb deformity is the swan neck thumb. Here, the carpometacarpal joint of the thumb is flexed or adducted. The metacarpophalangeal joint is hyperextended and the interphalangeal joint is flexed. Type 4 deformity is the gamekeeper's thumb. Here it is the metacarpophalangeal joint which is most involved and it is radially deviated and this happens because the ulnar collateral ligament has become unstable due to attrition or rupture of the ulnar collateral ligament. If instead of radial deviation of the thumb at the metacarpophalangeal joint it is hyperextended due to instability of the volar plate it is classified as type 5 deformity of the thumb in rheumatoid arthritis. The sixth type of thumb involvement in rheumatoid arthritis is the arthritis mutilans where there can be a bone loss at any level. Question number 8. Who is known as the father of microsurgery? Julius Jacobson, Harry Bunke, Alexis Carroll, Robert Ackland. The correct answer is Harry Bunke, who is referred to as the father of microsurgery. Harry Bunke received his medical degree from the New York Medical College in 1951. In 1964, he reported a rabbit ear replantation, the first report of successfully using blood vessels 1 mm in size. In 1966, he reported the transplantation of a monkey's great toe to the hand. And in 1969, along with David McLean, he performed the first successful microvascular transplant using omentum to fill a large scalp defect. Not only at his own center, he helped do the first microvascular transplants at various hospitals all over the world. Question number 9. The Ishiguro technique is used in the treatment of swan neck deformity, boutonniere deformity, mallet finger, or intrinsic plus deformity. And the correct answer is the Ishiguro technique is used in the treatment of mallet finger. The aims of management of mallet avulsion fracture are to correct the volar subluxation of the terminal phalanx and to reattach or realign the bone fragment. The procedure of the Ishiguro technique or the extension block pinning consists of first flexing the joint and passing a K wire proximal to the dorsal fragment to block its dorsal and proximal movement. Then the joint is extended to reduce the fracture and a second retrograde wire is passed to immobilize the distal interphalangeal joint. Question number 10. In hemihamate arthroplasty, the portion of the hamate that is used as a graft is the proximal articular surface or radial articular surface with the capitate or the ulnar articular surface with the triquetral or the distal articular surface. The correct answer is in hemihamate arthroplasty, 
the portion of the hamid that is used as a graft is the distal articular surface of the hamid. Reconstruction of the volar plate of the middle phalanx at the proximal interphalangeal joint is needed in such situations where the volar aspect of the base of the middle phalanx is either destroyed or crushed in injury like this. This reconstruction can be achieved by two techniques. One by advancing the volar plate and this procedure is known as volar plate arthroplasty described by Eaton. The next option available is replacement of the volar base of the middle phalanx by using a portion of the hamate bone known as hemihamate replacement arthroplasty. So in such a situation when a debridement of the crushed pieces of bone or the destroyed bone is done, the resultant defect will be like this on the volar aspect of the base of the middle phalanx. To replace this defect, we can note that the distal articular surface of the hamate has a very striking resemblance to this portion of the base of the middle phalanx. This can be harvested as a free bone graft which can fit into the defect and create a very congruous articular surface of the proximal interphalangeal joint. This piece of the hamate bone which is used as a free bone graft is fixed using a screw. I hope you enjoyed this session of the hand surgery quiz, the fun way to learn hand surgery. Please comment on whether you found it difficult or easy and most importantly whether you found it useful. And please scan this QR code with your mobile to instantly access the YouTube channel to see the latest in learning hand surgery.